Welcome to Kima Palms Recovery's YouTube channel, where we post continuing education videos to keep you up to date on relevant information in our field. This presentation is on chronic pain and the trauma egg. Thank you to our presenting partner, Eric McLaughlin with Intervention 911 and Kima Palms' very own Dr. James Flowers. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on more continuing education videos just like this one. Hope you enjoy. I'm just going to introduce um, Dr. James Flowers. Uh oh. Thank you guys. And I'm so happy to be able to. Yeah, he said, uh oh. Yeah, I'm not going to go there. I won't tell our old stories. Dr. Flowers and I have been business partners for over 20 years now. And I'm so happy to have he and Eric both present today. They're two of uh, my most respected people that I respect and, and learn from in the industry. So I'm just, I'm honored to have you you guys here today. We've, been, like I said, Dr. Flowers and I have been in business together for 20 years. We've been been doing, treating people with pain for 20 years and then combined with the substance use issues uh, for the past seven years. So really excited to hear him today and to have this combination. We know that people deal with trauma and they deal with, if they deal with addiction, they deal with trauma and, and many, many people deal with pain. So I am just honored. Uh, Dr. Flowers received his PhD from Sam Houston University. He holds an LPCS. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to let him take this over. We get, he's got a lot to say. And if I don't turn it over, he's probably going to mute my mic because he, he, I may tell stories. But here we go. <laughs> Welcome, James. Thank you, Tonda. There's a, there's, a, there's a lot of history there. Yes, Tonda and Michael and I have been working together for 20 years, which is just I think 21 years actually now, but it's just crazy. And, and, you know, what I would say is, is this is a great Tonda and Michael and I don't get to be in the same room very often at all. And we're not today either, but we don't get to be on the same zoom calls very often. So what I would like to say is Tonda, thank you for everything you're doing leading right now at, at Kima Palms. And I'm so proud to be a uh, founder and CEO of uh, Kima Palms Recovery. It's an amazing program. As most of you know, I've built most of the pain programs around the country. Uh, this is my 29th or 30th year uh, in business and in practice, really, I guess I should say, and really being an entrepreneur in this uh, space that we're in. But I would absolutely say that I would not be where I am today if it was not for Michael Beard and Tonda Chapman. And we make an amazing team and love working side by side uh, with them every single day. So I'm just real excited and so excited that Eric and I could get our calendars together. And so thanks for, for being here. And now I'm going to see if I can share my screen because usually I have an assistant doing this for me. And she, because we had ice storms and her house flooded, she's not here today. And by the way, I had five pipes in my own home burst and it's just a crazy time in Houston. So let me see if I can share my screen. I think I'm supposed to double click. Is that it? Tonda, do you see that? You got it. All right. Yay. Okay. So Crystal, at any time, if you need to interrupt me or if I'm running way too short or I'm running early, just, just say something or Lauren or anybody out there is welcome to I do that. Today. <laughs> Today, what we're going to talk about is my passion, and that's chronic pain, addiction, and really the healing process of chronic pain. And it really is a, a great precursor to what Eric is going to be talking about, because with chronic pain, there is indefinitely trauma. There is always trauma related to chronic pain, no matter what type of chronic pain it is, whether it's a three millimeter tiny herniated disc or someone was shot six times and had multiple gunshot wounds and lots of neurological damage and are in the healing process. So uh, I'm really excited that we get to talk about chronic pain and then go right into Eric and talk about the trauma uh, uh, or the trauma egg. So the first thing that I'm going to do, though, is Michael and I were in Los Angeles uh, last year with Shireen Janty at Music Cares and uh, got to visit uh, and see Macklemore uh, perform. And this is a song that he wrote and performed. And I just wanna start with this song because it touched every time I hear it, I cry. Because for 30 years now, I have been intimately involved in physician practices around the United States that prescribe opiate uh, prescriptions to chronic pain patients. 
and not just a little bit of opiates, but a lot of opiates to chronic pain patients around the United States. And I've worked in academic and university settings where physicians prescribe opiates. And I've worked in private practice settings where physicians prescribe opiates. And, and it has been amazing to watch this 30 year curve of opiates go from this opophilia type feeling of we have to prescribe opiates to an opophobic feeling of we can't prescribe opiates because we're going to get arrested and go to prison. When indeed the real reason should be is, is we just don't need opiates beyond 90 days, but that's not what's happened. So let me play this video. It's, it's, uh, very rated R. So if you want to, if you want to mute your microphone and not hear this video, it's okay, but that's how important it is to me. So we're going to start with this. If I can figure out how to change the screen. Said it wasn't a gateway drug. My homie was taking subs and he ain't wake up the whole while. These billionaires, they kicked up, paying off Congress, so we take their drugs. Murderers who will never face the judge. And we dance into a song about a bass gone numb. But I seen homies turn gray, noses draining blood. I could have been gone, our 30s faded in that tub. That's Prince, Michael and Whitney, that's Amy Ledger, Rick MC, that's Yams, that's DJ AM. Goddamn, they're making the killing. Now it's getting the tension, cause Sarah, Katie, and Billy. But this shit's been going on from Seattle out to South Philly, it just moved about the city and it spread out to the burbs. Now it's everybody's problem. Got a nation on the verge. Take activists off the market, jack the price up on the surf. But Purdue Pharma's about to move that work. The drug dealer was a doctor, doctor had the blood from big pharma, pharma. He said that he would heal me, heal me, but he only gave me problems, problems. My drug dealer was a doctor. Had the blood from Big Pharma, Pharma I think he trying to kill me, kill me He tried to kill me for a dollar, dollar and these devils, they keep on talking to me. They screaming, open the bottle. I want to be at peace. My hand is gripping that throttle. I'm running out of speed. Try to close my eyes, but I just keep on sweating through these sheets. Through these sheets for a horseman. They won't let me forget. I want to forge a prescription. Because, doctor, I need some more of it. When more pain and heroin is more of your budget. I said I never use a needle, but sure, fuck it. I'm caught up. I'm on one. I'm nauseous. No options. Exhausted. This is not what I started. Walking carcass, I lost everything I wanted. My blinds drawn, too gone to leave this apartment. My drug dealer was a doctor, doctor. Had the blood from Big Pharma, Pharma. He said that he would heal me, heal me. But he only gave me problems, problems. My drug dealer was a doctor, doctor. Had the blood from Big Pharma, Pharma. Dollar, dollar. Re-up, re-up, that certificate signed the prenup. Ain't no coming back from this prick set after the Sambi and Adderall's annex bench. Best friends with the thing that's killing me. Enemies with my best friend, there's no healing me. Refilling these, refilling these. They say it's death, death is the two sins of DLC. So God grant me the serenity. Accept the things I cannot change Courage to change the things I can And the wisdom to know the difference And the wisdom to know the difference You know, uh, Macklemore was walking on stage and he fell and twisted his wrist and ended up having to go to an emergency room to have it looked at. And at the emergency room at, I think it was in Seattle where he did it, 
uh, he was in pain, the first visit to the emergency room, his wrist wasn't broken, and they gave him a prescription for 90 Vicodin right there on the spot. Um, probably a little bit because who he is, but I've seen in emergency rooms in Houston and everywhere else around the country that this happens all the time. You know, nowadays, uh, it's not 90 Vicodin. I was in an emergency room here in Houston probably, I don't know, six weeks ago, talking to a group of ER doctors that were changing shifts. And there was about 30 ER docs going, uh, 15 coming off shift and 15 coming on shift. And we were doing an opiate talk. And three of the doctors raised their hand and said, listen, I totally understand what you mean about opiates and frequent flyers to the emergency room. But the easiest thing for me to do as a physician, instead of clogging an emergency room, is to write a prescription for 12 Vicodin and get the guy out of the emergency room. And that, to me, just blew my mind. And, and here it is after the Purdue Pharma settlement, and after the OxyContin debacle, which really continues but um, that ER docs are still writing these prescriptions. But um, I just think the words in this song are so powerful because addiction often does start with a prescription. Uh, when Purdue Pharma started selling prescription opioid painkiller OxyContin way back in 1996, Dr. Sackler, whose Sackler family owns, or the single owners of Purdue Pharma, asked people gathered at a lunch party, and wanted them to envision a natural disaster like an earthquake or hurricane or a blizzard. And all of this was caught on video and in emails. The debut of OxyContin said Dr. Sackler will be followed by a blizzard of prescriptions that will absolutely bury the competition in the pain world. And they wanted to absolutely dominate the world when it came to controlling chronic pain. Five years later, when questions were raised about the risk of addiction and overdoses that came with taking OxyContin and opioid medications, Dr. Sackler, the owner again, outlined a strategy that critics have long accused the company of unleashing, diverting the blame onto others, particularly the people who became addicted. Dr. Sackler said in an email to the entire staff and executive leadership at Purdue Pharma, we have to hammer on the abusers in every way possible. He wrote this in February of 2001. These people are the culprits in the problem and they are reckless criminals. So instead of taking any action and looking inside and thinking, wow, we have doctors out there riding 180 OxyContin a month, that may be too much. That's not what he did. What he did is has sent those doctors to Hawaii, sent them to Cuba, sent them to Puerto Rico, sent them all over the world, really fish, fishing Cabo San Lucas and paid for these elaborate trips and subsidized the sales reps for Purdue Pharma and gave them huge awards and bonuses that the more prescriptions they were, their doctors wrote, the bigger their bonuses were. So in September of 17, the CEO, the new CEO of Purdue Pharma, again, noted in an email that there are too many prescriptions being written at too many high doses for too long at a time for conditions that don't require OxyContin or that type of an opiate by doctors who lack the requisite training and how to use them appropriate. By the way, the second highest writer of OxyContin, OxyContin in the United States are dentists. Dentists writing prescriptions for an opiate called OxyContin for dental pain. The state's lawsuit, but this was Oklahoma, concluded the opioid ep epidemic is not a mystery to the people who started it, meaning the Sacklers and Purdue Pharma. The defendants knew exactly what they were doing. So on September 18th, September 18 of 2018, what did Purdue Pharma do instead of trying to go out and educate and give money and train people on addiction and talk to physicians about prescribing patterns? they decided to go out and get the patent on buprenorphine. Purdue Pharma, who killed hundreds of thousands of people in the United States, now owns the patent on Suboxone buprenorphine, which is just absolutely blows my mind. So they own both ends of the spectrum at this point. But in February 2021, just this year, a federal judge approved a landmark $8 billion Purdue Pharma opioid settlement. I don't think $8 billion is enough. Um, 
Purdue Pharma has many, 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 many more billions of dollars than that. And the Sackler family themselves have, uh, I think Forbes named the Sackler family, the 12th wealthiest family in the world um, last year. And all of that money was based on Oxycontin cells. So addiction does often start with a prescription. 377 million prescriptions were written in the United States in 2019 for opiates. That's the rate of 66 and a half prescriptions for every 100 people in this country. Four out of five heroin users report that their addiction started with a prescription. In other words, like uh, our friend Macklemore, who uh, sprang a wrist, uh, started with a prescription. Then it went into Oxycontin, then he tried heroin, and then he got sober, thank God. In 2017, more than a third of all adults in the United States were prescribed an opioid for chronic pain. What are some of the commonly abused pain drugs in general, not just Oxycontin and not just Vicodin, alcohol? Many people try to mask their pain with alcohol. Many people who have been taking Vicodin, many people who have been taking Oxycontin for too long of a period of time, develop a tolerance for it. And then they begin to drink more and more alcohol to help the effects of the Oxycontin because they're experiencing something called hyperalgesia, which, doesn't, which means they need to take more and more and more pain medication, thus the hyperalgesia, to have the same effect. So they mask it again with alcohol. Of course, Oxycontin and Oxycodone, Demerol, Dilaudid, Morphine, Codeine, <coughs> Methamphetamine is becoming more and more used uh, now as a pain medication, uh, and Methadone. We just had a, a chronic pain patient that has multiple fractured, uh, old fractures in his spine, multiple uh, surgeries, rods in his spine, and he says, the only thing that helps me is microdosing with meth. And no one is going to be able to take me off of meth because when I, when I smoke meth, my pain completely goes away. Of course it goes away when you smoke meth, but it's not the answer. But we're seeing meth and heroin more and more and more because, of course, Oxycontin is becoming more difficult uh, to obtain in doctor's offices anyway. Commonly abused prescriptions, uh, sleep medications like Ambien and Lunesta because chronic pain patients report that they sleep on average, three to four hours, sometimes two hours before waking, and then get up and walk around the house and try to fall asleep and go back to walking and then go back to lay down. Non-addictive pain meds like Ultram or Gabapentin, Soma, and then of course, Benzos, uh, Xanax, Alprazolam, uh, Clonopin to help bring the anxiety down that calms the nervous system. And when the nervous system is calmer, we see a lower level of pain typically, but then we have the results of being knocked out by a benzodiazepine. Our bodies really begin to build a tolerance after about 90 days. That's not very long, but after 90 days of acute onset of pain and being prescribed any type of pain medication, again, whether it's Vicodin or whether it's Oxys or any other type of medication, our bodies and the chemicals in our brain become tolerant of it and they become dependent. And we begin to form an addiction to that medication. Whether we have an addiction in our history, whether our family has addiction, whether we've had an addiction in our own life, we become tolerant of that pain medication and we develop a physical dependence, thus an addiction to it. And then there's also a category called pseudo addiction where early on in chronic or early on in pain, even in the, op even in the uh, acute phase of pain, you have pseudo addiction. Let's just say post-surgical pain. Someone has surgery, has a, a, a 360 degree cage put into their spine. That's very, very painful. It's a 12 hour surgery. And that person will absolutely need opiates post-surgical, post-surgery for a few days or a week at a time. But what happens is, is they begin to act as an addict because they're chasing their pain, saying, I need more, I need more, I need more. And at that point, there is no addiction. It's called a pseudo addiction because they're trying to chase their pain. But if they continue to act that way and the hospital continues to prescribe beyond a reasonable time, then it goes into the physical dependence, tolerance, increased tolerance or decreased tolerance, and then uh, an addiction. 
tolerance really is a state of adaptation in which exposure to a drug induces changes that result in a diminution, sorry about that, of one or more of the drug's effects over time. So in other words, over time, we need an increased amount of that opiate to get the same effect as we had previously. Physical dependence is really a state of adaptation and is a manifestation by a drug class very specific to withdrawal syndromes that can be produced by abruptly stopping the medication, a rapid dose reduction, decreased blood level of the drug, and or administration of an antagonist. We experience that physical withdrawal symptom and start to begin to sweat, our joints ache, we begin to feel like we have the flu. And so what do we do? We grab that bottle and say we need more medication because we're in that physical pain, not understanding what stage they're really truly in. Addiction, of course, everyone on here knows is a primary chronic neurobiologic disease with genetic, psychosocial, and environmental factors influencing its development and manifestations. It's characterized by behaviors really that include one or more of the following. Uh, impaired control over drug use, in other words, chasing that medication, trying to stay ahead of the pain, but staying way ahead of the pain. Compulsive use, saying don't stop this medication. Orthopedic surgeons nowadays will typically give three to four days of pain medication and patients uh, who have a tendency to have a low threshold for pain or low coping skills continue to call orthopedic surgeons saying, I need more, I need more, I need more. And they become compulsive users to try to chase that pain. And their brain is playing a trick on them telling them that they're actually in a higher level of pain than they actually are when it's really caused by an anxiety attack, a nerve uh, condition, meaning there's nothing actually wrong with the body. It's in a repair process, but we feel like we have to have that medication to lower that, that, that uh, physical feeling or pre even perceived physical feeling and continued use despise har despite harm and craving. Pseudo addiction really is patient behaviors that occur when pain is undertreated. Patients uh, with unrelieved pain may become focused on obtaining medications, they clock watch, and they may otherwise seem inappropriately drug seeking. Again, typically this is in that acute phase of pain, either post surgical pain when they're experiencing that pseudo addiction and they feel like they're drug seeking, or the doctor feels like they're drug seeking. Even such behaviors as illicit drug use and deception can occur in his effort or her effort to obtain relief, but they haven't actually gone into that addiction phase quite yet, but the likelihood is very high if they continue to use. So how did we get here? It's an interesting question of how, you know, cocaine use and cocaine for chronic pain goes way, way back to the 1800s. But really, how did we get in the crisis and the trauma situation that we're in today? Uh, and it, and it's, uh, it was an interesting phenomena that happened. And I think with, with all of the best intentions, uh, uh, Bill Clinton uh, met with Congress, met with political action folks from pharmacy companies, and they talked about the large population in the United States that were undertreated for pain. And that doctors felt like if they couldn't write enough prescription for pain medication, the doctors felt like they were going to go to jail. Hospital systems felt pressure to prescribe more pain and they were afraid to prescribe more pain. So on October the 31st of 2000, again, I think with the best intentions, Bill Clinton signed a bill into law. And that bill said that all healthcare providers, not some, but all healthcare providers, must, not can or should, but must treat pain adequately. So all healthcare providers must treat pain adequately. That means hospitals, that means private practice physicians, that means nurse practitioners, that means private uh, practice offices, anyone with the ability to write a prescription for pain medication must treat pain adequately. And then the Joint Commission, who we all are aware of through our treatment centers and, and hospital systems in the United States, the Joint Commission followed Bill Clinton and said, if you do not adequately address pain, you will lose your Joint Commission accreditation. 
So for a hospital system, Methodist Hospital in Houston, the largest hospital system, or Memorial Hermann even in Houston, the largest hospital systems in the Southwest United States, Southeast United States, if they lose their Joint Commission accreditation, what else do they lose? They lose the right to, uh, to, to, uh, to treat Medicare patients, and then they're going to lose their right to treat insured patients, and they'll go out of business. So every single hospital room, every single doctor's office, every single healthcare office in the United States began putting up a little picture on the wall of a hospital room, a private practice, a doctor's office, a dentist office, and they were like, Sir, ma'am, can you look at the wall and you see these 10 faces? Where are you on this scale? Zero means no pain at all. 10 means the most pain that you could possibly experience. If you'll rate your pain, I'll put it in your chart. Well, most patients who rate their pain in a hospital system or go to see a doctor for pain are feeling or perceiving at least that they're in a high level of pain and rate that pain 90% of the time, either a seven, eight, nine, or 10. Joint Commission said, if it's high, that you must treat it. So therefore, every time a patient reported a high pain level in a hospital system or a doctor's office, they were written a prescription for pain medication, or they were given a shot of morphine in a hospital bed and treated because of this law that went into effect on October the 31st of 2000. That's really when Pandora's box uh, was opened. When doctors began prescribing opioids more liberally, way back even in the 80s, they thought, they thought only a fraction of patients would become addicted. Now we know otherwise. <clears throat> and I wish I was sitting in front of a live audience because I always like to see people raise their hands and answer this question. What is the single most quoted sentence in American literature? And I know you guys can't answer right now. I, I can monitor but, the chat for you if you want. You want to yeah, so if, yeah sure. If, if someone knows what the single most quoted sentence in American literature is, that would be amazing. <laughs> if, if, if Candy Finnegan is on this, she'll surely know. Because <laughs> <laughs> we've see. talked about this. Or Louise Stanger. If Louise Stanger is watching this, she'll surely know. But the single most, I'll go ahead and not pause. The single most quoted sentence in American literature is in the Journal of the American Medical Association, which is the highest rated, most respected medical journal in the world. Very peer reviewed journal, very respected journal. And that sentence says, OxyContin is not addictive. That is one sentence and it has been used more in more literature and more articles and more advertising than any other sentence in history. And it opened, again, along with Joint Commission, along with the law that Bill Clinton signed into law, and then JAMA, which every physician in the United States, really the world, subscribed to because it's the most respected journal in medicine, said OxyContin is not addictive. And, and everyone used that in lawsuits, when a patient would overdose and die, when patients sold medication and another person died, they would go back to the Journal of the American Medical Association and see right here, and lawyers used it in cases and said, it says right here in JAMA, OxyContin is not addictive. We did not intentionally kill that patient. And in fact, that was in the 1980s and only two years ago, did the new editor of JAMA, and I'd love to get a copy of this, I, I, I don't have it, but the new editor of JAMA two years ago in the opening, uh, in his editorial letter apologized and of course retracted that statement and said what a horrible mistake it was that the, that sentence was posted or written in the most respected medical journal in the world. Because what happens is, when you went to the doctor, and even today this continues because of a mindset that we have. Physicians see 50, 60 patients a day in their practices, sometimes more, and they come in. The number one reason to see a physician is chronic pain or ongoing pain or acute pain. And the easiest thing for the doctor to do is to say, I want you to take one of these every day until I think of something else. 
because hopefully this will keep you happy, keep you out of my office, and hopefully it'll take care of your pain and you won't have to come back as quickly. Also, doctors and patients feel that the patient comes in, says, I have a headache, a sore throat, a backing ache, my stomach hurts. And the doctor is often thinking, this is a frequent flyer in my office and he's really a pain in my neck. I hear that thousands, I have heard that thousands and thousands and thousands of times from some of the most respected physicians in the world that frequent flyers that come to doctor's offices with constant pain complaints really are just a pain in the neck. Drug overdose is the leading cause of accidental death in the United States with 65,000 legal lethal drug overdoses in 2018. Opioid addiction, even today, post the Purdue Pharma debacle, is, the drive, is driving the epidemic with 20,000 overdose deaths related to prescription pain relievers and 13,000 related to heroin. From 2000 to 2019, the overdose deaths and cells of substance use disorder treatment admissions related to prescription pain relievers increased that much as well. The overdose death in 2018 was nearly six times the 2000 rate with more than 130 million individuals suffering from chronic pain. It's imperative we look at treating pain and addiction together as a seamless pain recovery program. And really that's what we do at Chemo Palms. And that's what treatment centers around the United States and private practitioners who work with chronic pain patients really need to look at how to join a 12 step recovery approach or whatever their recovery approach is, whether it's 12 step or smart recovery or anything else, but wrapping it together within the ability to work with experts at treating chronic pain together. If you treat just the addiction, people can do extremely well. They can go to detox. They do well in detox. They go to a 12 step or other type program. They do fantastic in the program. They feel amazing. They feel on top of the world. They leave the program three weeks later, two weeks later, stress comes up, their pain comes back. Sometimes their pain comes back immediately. They make an appointment to go to their doctor. They talk about their pain and the doctor scratches his head and says, well, why did you stop taking it? I prescribe it to you. You have two, three millimeter herniated discs, take this medication. And the relapse rate for a chronic pain patient who's been in a 12 step program that did not discuss or have an expert leading a pain recovery program is over 90% in the first year. The Charleston Gazette reported that opioid wholesalers shipped almost 800 million, 800 million oxycodone and hydrocodone pills into West Virginia over a six year period. That's enough for 433 pills for every person in the state of West Virginia. Meanwhile, 1,728 West Virginians died of overdoses from those two drugs. So enough about how we got here. We all know, we read it, we breathe it, we see it every single day. Opioids are a trauma in our country. Opioids have caused Purdue Pharma, the Sackler family, other uh, big pharma companies who produce pain medications, physician practices who continue to prescribe pain have caused a tremendous amount of trauma in our country and a lot of death in our country. And, and, you know, physicians, I believe, go to school with all the best intentions and they want to heal people and they want people to feel better. But when someone comes into the office and pain is completely subjective and my level seven pain and your level seven pain are completely different, a physician can't see it, can't really understand it other than the look on your face and that stupid zero to 10 scale that's all over the world that says what level of pain are you in? Are you in? And they write a prescription. So how do we move beyond that? And how do physicians and private practitioners and substance abuse counselors and psychologists and psychiatrists and physicians and all of us that treat people, 33% of the population at least suffers from chronic pain at one point or another. So how do we look at it really as the disease class and how do we get rid of it? Pain, of course, is a very unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with specialized nerve endings that signal actual or potential tissue damage. 
always subjective. My pain and your pain are never going to feel the same way. But I want to say this, if a patient regards their experience as having physical pain and they report it as pain, we are no one to judge another person's physical feeling. It has to be accepted as pain. We have to let them understand that we believe them, we trust them, we can see that they're hurting, we can understand that they're hurting, and we look at it as acute pain, chronic pain. Acute pain is tissue damage, where you fall off a curb and sprain your ankle or sprain your wrist. It's a protective functioning saying, go to the doctor, put ice on it, put heat on it, and it resolves upon healing. Chronic pain is beyond 90 days. Our bodies were designed, I believe, by God to heal within about 90 days. But pain, can, if it continues beyond that 90 days, it's a chronic pain symptom. It no longer serves a useful purpose. It changes in pain signals and detection in our brain, and it degrades our health and our function. We become depressed. We become anxious. We become lethargic. We become just sad. We have a gray cloud sitting over us. And we just don't know what to do other than reach for a medication or try to feel better. Transition from chronic pain, though, there's another level of chronic pain, and that's chronic pain syndrome. The likelihood of developing chronic pain syndrome is completely unrelated to pain intensity. So in other words, a person can have a level nine pain on a consistent basis, and another person can have a level nine pain on a consistent basis. One person has chronic pain. The other person has something called chronic pain syndrome. Chronic pain syndrome is where psychological variables come into play, such as severe depression, severe anxiety, anger, somatic focus, and self-perceived disability consistently have been found to be the most accurate predictor, predictor of subsequent pain syndrome development. And what it is, you have acute pain, you have chronic pain, but people go to work, they thrive, they do things, they continue to function. Chronic pain syndrome is a failure to thrive. Crystal, I'm where just am I? I'm you a 10 minute warning. Great, thank you. Yep. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna run through, I'm really gonna try to get through this, I'm so sorry. Um, anticipatory pain is conditioned pain responses where we absolutely think if we get up and cut the lawn, we get up and do the dishes, we get off the sofa, we get out of bed, we're going to have pain. Guess what? If we believe that, we are going to have pain. It's an internal physiological and psychological emotional trigger that activates our nervous system. The only way we feel physical pain is right here through our brain. And the way that we feel it into our brain is because every nerve in the body connects to the spinal cord that goes to the brain. And the more our nervous system moves and is triggered by anxiety, depression, fear, sleeplessness, poor diet, lack of exercise, all of that triggers our nervous system, our pain level goes through the roof. The calmer our nervous system can be, the less physical pain that we're going to feel. It's all associated with the previous episodes of pain and what we experienced historically from that trauma that later Eric is gonna talk about in a few minutes. It's biological, it's a nerve signal that something's wrong. It's psychological, meaning we assign meaning to our pain signal. And it's also cultural. Roles are assigned to the person in pain. Honey, don't do the dishes, I'll do them. You don't have to cook tonight, I'll cook. You don't have to go to work anymore because you hurt. Let's get on disability. Family and cultural beliefs about pain as well. In my 29 years of experience, I have literally treated less than five, probably less than three Asian people with chronic pain. And I have treated thousands and thousands and thousands of people with chronic pain. And it's a cultural belief about chronic pain and how Asians create their own recovery method using meditation, mindfulness, Tai Chi, and not abusing or going to doctors to doctor shop for opiate medication. Addictive disorders are related to opiate use, of course, other substance use disorders, depressive disorders, sleep, anxiety, PTSD, and trauma. Again, that Eric and other mood disorders are often co-occurring once you get into that chronic pain syndrome. And when we have anxiety, it produces sleep problems. Sleep problems increase and cause coping difficulties. And all of those things cause an increased level of pain 
which cause increased anxiety, sleep problems, depression, and lower levels of coping. And we get in this horrible spiraling cycle going downward. What does pain do to your body? It limits our thinking and our cognitive abilities. It increases our heart rate and our breath rate, our blood pressure, decreases nutrients, absorption, increases our blood sugar, increases the sticky platelets, decreases our immune function, causes infertility, increases our aging and we look old and we feel old, increases obesity because all we do is lay in bed and eat or sit on a sofa and eat. And it's associated with depression and it causes muscle tension. And the more muscle tension we have, the tighter it's on the, on the nervous system and the tighter the nervous system is, the higher level of pain that we're going to feel. And this is a typical profile of a pain patient, fear, depression, anxiety, frustration, and fury. I'm never gonna get better. I want them to cure me. I can't stand this. Why do I hurt? I'm useless. No one believes me. Quality of life, psychological, social consequences, and socioeconomic consequences all come into play. So many chronic pain patients think that their providers and their doctors say it's in your head. Well, I always say it is in your head because this brain is telling you that you're in the pain in here. Why should I see a mental health professional? Because we can help you overcome the physical sensation and the emotional responses to your pain that will lower the physical sensation. They say pain is medical. It is but it also has a huge emotional and psychological overlay. And there are a lot of cultural factors involved in treating chronic pain. The rate of depression is five times higher among those with the general population. It's repeatedly found to be one of the best predictors, depression is, of intensity of pain. The higher a person rates on the Beck depression inventory, I can look at a BDI, and tell you what level of pain a patient is gonna to report to me before they tell me what level of pain that they're at. Is it a cause or effect? Are they depressed first or are they depressed secondarily? Doesn't really matter. Depression causes more pain either way. Same thing with anxiety, works just like depression. Clinicians often see, and so do physicians, see back pain patients as angry. Anger is present, it exacerbates depression, it intensifies the pain and intensifies distress. You have to report the patient, accept the patient's report of pain. Fear and avoidance is huge, but, but this belief system in our brain is more disabling than the pain itself. We have to move people into an acceptance mode of their pain using ACT and DBT and allow people and help them and CBT allowing them and talking to them about catastrophizing and ending the catastrophizing phase that they're in. That's that pain cycle again. There's a huge relationship between catastrophizing and pain intensity. Pain causes sleeplessness. Lack of intimacy is one of the highest things that pain causes. Somatic issues, children act out, cognitive issues, poor self-esteem, kinesophobia, fear of movement, helplessness. It strongly suggests the chronic, for a chronic pain syndrome patient with high depression and high anxiety is the biggest indicator that surgical intervention will not be successful. Harvard Mental Health Newsletter put out a letter a couple of years ago in their journal that said that 97% of all spine surgery patients have the same amount or increased level of pain four years post-surgery with a depressed and highly anxious patient prior to surgery. We wanna move people from a cure me mode or cure me doctor to be an active participant. And again, that's really what a good quality multidisciplinary pain program does is teaches someone from taking it away from the healthcare providers onto yourself and being an active participant in healing your own body and healing your own mind using things like mindfulness, going through an evaluation where you do a complete medical and psychiatric evaluation, functional capacity where you see what level of mobility a patient has, pain assessment, psychosocial testing, looking at their addiction history, a nutritional assessment, and a spiritual assessment that helps guide the multidisciplinary team in treating a patient like we do at Chemo Palms Recovery different non-medical uh, procedures. 
treatment really consists of a medically detox, medically supervised detox, residential through outpatient, medical and psychological and psychosocial and addiction treatment, individual and group therapy, and a lot of family work helping people understand using these things, chemical dependency education, medication education, psychoeducational groups, biofeedback, cognitive behavioral therapy, DBT, guided imagery, trauma work, EMDR, hypnosis, meditation, Tai Chi, yoga, adaptive exercise. We always want people to move their bodies using yoga, Tai Chi, experiential therapies, uh, equine therapy, again, DBT, ACT, massage, chiropractic treatment, acupuncture, biofeedback, and hypnosis, which are all things that we do at Kima. And that's what a good multidisciplinary pain program should utilize. Some active and passive uh, approaches, providing referral sources, comprehensive pre-admission evaluations, comprehensive multidisciplinary evaluations, residential rehab treatment should be about four to six weeks post detox. Using again, some of these therapeutic modalities. And Crystal, if we want to email this PowerPoint out to whomever would like it for things that I have not been able to talk about, we can certainly do that. Wonderful, because everybody's been asking. <laughs> Good. The awareness that emerges through paying attention and mindfulness on purpose in the present moment in a non judgmental way to the unfolding of experiencing the moment, right? That's John Cabot Zen. Mindfulness based training is a key to managing your own chronic pain and teaching that to the patients with whom you work in your practice. Let me see if there's anything else, breath awareness, body scanning. There's so much that I'm not getting to. I'm so sorry. Um, I'll end on this. This being human is a guest house. Every morning is a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes from an unexpected visitor such as pain. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house, empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, they all meet, meet them at the door laughing and let them in. Be grateful for whatever comes your way because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. And so I'm so sorry that I'm out of time, but Crystal, thank you. Happy to answer any questions when you get there. Email questions. I'm happy to send this PowerPoint out. And uh, Kima Palms uh, uh, is an amazing pain program. If we can help you in any way, I would love to. Uh, Maggie Chapman is uh, <laughs> one of the best pain therapists I've ever had the pleasure of working with. Happens to be Tonda's daughter and my niece but she has learned from the best, I think. And we are very, very happy to be here. So thank you all. And Eric, I'm sorry if I ran a little bit in your time. So keep going. <laughs> I'm still muted. I'm over here. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You're good. Uh, don't stress it. We were going to take just a couple of questions. I've been kind of reviewing kind of what's been coming in. Guys, the PowerPoint is going to be sent out to everybody that's here, okay? So you don't have to specifically request it or anything like that, just so that you know, because I know it's popped up like a million times, um, it, which is great. It's super useful information, um, but that will go out with the eval link, so everybody will get it. Um, <clears throat> one question a person had asked was um, that they have a family member that is had spinal surgery, is abusing alcohol, what steps... Um, do you suggest to acquire help? Um, he's become physically debilitated and recently had a heart attack and lives out of state. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to grab a, a, a book real quick. I'll be right back in two seconds. I'm going to grab it on my shelf. <laughs> so I, I did a fellowship training literally 30 years ago at one of the best academic institutions in the world for working with chronic pain in a multidisciplinary way and, and learned from these big, huge, thick books, right, that we learn in academia and when we teach college and we're professors. And 28 years later, I'm in London speaking uh, and I run into this book in London and it's, a, it's an animated book. 
and I read it and I sat down and I read it three times. I couldn't stop reading it. And I was like, oh my God, this is the the best book I have ever read on chronic pain. And I'm such an idiot that I didn't write this damn book. And I wish that I had. Um, uh, This isn't the book, but it's a a similar book, but um, I'm going to hold it up. And it says, anxiety is really strange. And it's an animated book. It's, it is just brilliant. And uh, the author, the author, the author is Steve Haynes. And he wrote another book and it's called pain is really strange. And it's extremely expensive. It's $11 (laughs) and you can buy it on Amazon. And I called this guy and hunted him down in London and spent half a day with him just, and now we have an ongoing uh, uh, professional relationship, but these are two of the best books for chronic pain I have ever read in my life. And every pain patient I work with has to read these books three times before I talk to them after my first interview and they're, it changes their lives. And they are simple. They are animated by an artist in London who is brilliant. And it just goes through all of the body and it's just fantastic. And it is exactly what I learned in an academic program at one of the best universities in the world, simplified into an animated drawing by an artist. So Steve Haynes, Pain is Really Strange, and anxiety is really strange. I, I wrote it in the chat for those of you that maybe yeah. missed it. So that's why so I was That's asking. what I would recommend for her family member um, yeah. as a start. And then, of course, if that doesn't work, then certainly you want to have an addiction assessment done and a pain assessment. And we would be ready, of course, willing to help with that. Yeah, you can definitely call Kima Palms and we're happy to help help walk you through any kind of help that you might need. So um, we're going to do one more quick one. And then I'm going to pass it off to Mr. McLaughlin. So um, I think this is an important one that I don't want to miss. Um, Hopefully I'm not cutting out. Am I still here? Okay. Yep. Okay. My, I saw a thing pop up. Okay. It says, how do you talk to a counseling client about, um, about this psycho ed without discounting their pain, uh, whether their pain may be real or not? So this is exactly what I say is, and it's not a trick, it's just the truth, and they don't realize what you're doing as a clinician. But when you're talking about their pain, and they're talking about their pain, and how bad their pain is, is for you to nod your head, acknowledge, say that must be awful. And then I say, gosh, that really must be causing some sleep problems. And they're like, Oh, my gosh, yes, I I don't sleep. And, and, and your anxiety, it must be causing a ton of anxiety for you. Oh my God, it does. Yes. And you know what? It, it, it's probably making you depressed. Oh my God. Yeah. How do you know me? So yes, it's making me depressed. And, and you're probably like angry, frustrated. Oh my God, I am. Yes. How do you know this? And then I say, because that's what chronic pain does it makes your physical pain worse. And I say the way that we feel pain, physical pain is through our brain. You hurt, but the things that make the pain worse are your nervous system and anxiety and sleeplessness and all of the things I just mentioned, aggravate the nervous system, make it shake that you don't even feel it shaking. It's so minimal, but it sends the pain signal up the spine 10 times faster, and it amplifies the physical feeling you're having, making it worse. So if you and I can work together on some mindfulness, some meditation, some breathing, some exercising to really bring down your nervous system without medications, I promise you, your pain level is going to come down. It's brilliant. And it's not rocket science, but it, it just works. Well, thank you. For more information on the treatment of chronic pain at Kima Palms Recovery, please call 866-604-1873. And without further ado, I want to introduce you to Mr. Eric McLaughlin um, and Ken Seeley, somewhere in the background in Hawaii, I know. Uh, Owners of Intervention 911 Ken Seeley Rehab and Ken Seeley Communities in Palm Springs. 
Hey everyone, it's uh, really an honor to be here. Uh, Tonda uh, mentioned as we were preparing for this that she has been wanting to do this for almost a year now. And I feel very honored to be thought of as a, a professional in the field uh, who could hopefully bring some good information to you guys. Um, we're really excited uh, for the presentation. Um, we love the work that Kima Palms does uh, as well as all the professionals and always wonderful to hear from Dr. Flowers. Um, uh, I'm the CEO and owner of Kinsley, uh Communities and Intervention 911. Um, we have a really strong family focus that's informed by our intervention work. Um, and that is kind of our specialty, working with families. If you have a family that you think, whoa, they're not gonna make it, there's no chance uh, for them to get going, we're the place for you. We have a family integration model that starts at day one of treatment in which we view the family as the client. And that is uh, echoed in kind of what Lauren was talking about with regards to our intervention trainings. Um, we use that philosophy to underscore everything we do, always with a trauma-informed approach. And we'll talk today a little bit about the trauma egg uh, process that all our clients get to do and why that's so valuable um, and how that integrates with that family approach uh, in such a meaningful way. Uh, we're located in Palm Springs, California. We're in network with Aetna and Anthem, uh, as well as uh, several other smaller providers. Uh, and we'd love to be able to help you. Um, and again, if you have that family that is uh, really been uh, kind of hit by addiction and needs more support than just getting their loved one to treatment, we're the place for you. Thanks. Eric McLaughlin, CEO at Intervention 911, is now going to present on the trauma egg. Hey everybody, so uh, my name is Aaron McLaughlin. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm uh, one of the co-owners of uh, Ken Seeley Communities and Intervention 911, um, and um, also uh, working towards my licensure as a social worker. So after many years of uh, being in recovery and working with people in recovery, I made a decision to uh, investigate, you know, kind of how I could better serve the population we work with by developing my clinical skills. And I had a really wonderful and amazing uh, experience in school uh, learning how to be a social worker uh, with an emphasis on mental health issues and drugs and alcohol. Um, uh, but one thing school kind of significantly underrepresented was the impact of trauma, uh, particularly in the field of substance abuse, mental health. And as we could see from Dr. Flowers' amazing presentation, pain. Um, and we'll talk a little bit uh, about some of the way in which uh, pain can influence, um, uh, can be influenced by the onset of trauma, whether that's childhood trauma or whether that's being in a car accident and why that kind of pulling that thing apart, that pain piece apart can be so challenging. And when he talks about increases in anxiety and depression as a result of pain, when you start to think about them as a complete picture, it makes a lot of sense. So thank you for a fantastic, fantastic lead in. Um, I would like to remember, remind everyone, because we are seeing this, the YouTube of the presentation will be available and I will send my presentation uh, to Crystal so that she can share that with you um, and you can get that. Thank um, you. <laughs> you're welcome. I'll, I'll probably repeat it two or three times. So uh, don't worry, you will get all this great information. Um, so, you know, one thing I wanted to do is, first of all, thank kind of some people who have been instrumental in my experience with trauma. And that would be Judy Crane uh, from the guest house who has um, started a program for professionals and therapists who want to be more experienced in um, dealing with trauma. And she kind of tricks you. Uh, and she tricks you by making you do your own work uh, as you learn about different modalities for treating trauma. And so, um, you know, we're going to talk today about the trauma egg as one of those modalities. And a lot of what I learned was from her. The other person I learned a lot for was my husband and business partner, Ken. Um, he has been instrumental in working with our therapeutic team to deliver the trauma egg experience to our clients. Um, and one of the things I want to touch on in today's presentation is exactly how, um, how we do that as a clinician or a trauma professional, how do we look at the trauma egg as an opportunity to push someone's recovery forward? And then how is that, how is that work with the family? 
Uh, how can we uh, take those things and use that to examine the family system? We're a big proponent of looking at addiction and mental health issues as a system oriented approach. And, and, and we look at that family system and that could be family of origin, family of choice, work family, social family. Uh, but we really take a, um, a, 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 a very holistic and systems approach and using the trauma egg can be very effective at better understanding family functioning. So the two things I want you to be thinking about as we go through this is how can I work with people who've experienced trauma using this device? And then uh, how can I apply that to the system that they might come from and understand better how I can support that system in the healing and recovery process? Um, so um, we'll go ahead and share the screen. Give me one second. Uh, we'll get that going. Eric, did Ken ever get that link? He did. He did. I just wanted to make sure that we it it that it got there. It did. Uh, Slideshow. All right. So, um, you know, kind of looking at the trauma egg at at Ken Sealy's and how we do uh, cracking down on trauma one egg at a time. Uh, that was Drew. Thank you for that cute title. Um, and and the idea, um, kind of with the trauma egg, is we're going to take a little journey on what is trauma. And, you know, many of you are familiar with trauma um, and understand uh, trauma. Uh, but I want to kind of give a, an insight as to kind of how we frame what trauma may be, because that's an important piece of being able to utilize the trauma egg with clients. You will get many clients who say, I don't really have any trauma. I was one of those. Um, and you will get many people who feel overwhelmed by their trauma and can't begin to even process it. And then you'll get many people who want to dive right in and think, oh my God, this is, I've been waiting to talk to someone about the path that brought me here and how it's informed my life. Right. Um, so, uh, trauma, uh, you know, can be defined as a deeply disturbing or distressing experience. And like with chronic pain and with pain, people experience things in all different sorts of ways. So what might be traumatic for me may not be traumatic or may be processed in a different way than someone else. So two people can be in a car crash and two people can have different relationships to that experience. It can be the impetus, uh, the traumatic kind of event that launches uh, substance use as a coping strategy to deal with kind of the, the symptoms of that car accident, or it can be something that someone in a very healthy way is able to process and kind of move through um, and, and not be impacted with. So like with pain, we don't take the approach that your trauma is wrong or right. Uh, what we do is we take the approach is look back at your life and tell me what experiences changed your feelings. When did you feel distressed? When did you feel disturbed? When did you feel unsafe? Uh, when did you feel neglected? And again, we, we have to be mindful not to judge those experiences um, and say, huh, that doesn't seem traumatic. Um, because it, we have to think about our own uh, system for being able to do those. And I'm going to give you a, a brief example. So, uh, you know, I mentioned, um, you know, we, we talk about trauma and, and, everybody can kind of identify with, with the big T, what we call the big T trauma, uh, being in war, uh, experiencing a fire, uh, having a car crash, uh, watching someone overdose or die. And, you know, one of the things that Dr. Flowers was talking about was the, the, the rate of overdose that we're experiencing and, and, and inherent in substance use is, I believe, an increased exposure to tra trauma. How can uh, people who use substances often find themselves in situations where they may be more prone to traumatic things happening, such as overdose? Um, and that can be uh, uh, something to consider. There could be pre-substance use trauma and post-substance use trauma. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but there's also what we call little t trauma. And little t trauma is anytime you may have felt unsafe, um, uh, you might have felt distressed and think of all the times you might have felt unsafe or distressed in your life. That's a lot of times, right? 
Um, you know, Ken often speaks about um, as a child uh, having the perfect parents, you know, and having no trauma. Um, and as he started to do this work, what he understood was that growing up, uh, there was a lot of bullying uh, that he experienced. And slowly, every day, over time, year after year, going to school and kind of uh, being afraid of what might happen develops, is, is it a trauma experience? Picture that person who's at war uh, and every morning they wake up, am I gonna have to kill someone today? Am I gonna be killed? That constant kind of fear can be uh, can can put us into our non uh, verbal kind of uh, reptilian brain, the amygdala, where our fight or flight is, and that can flood our system. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the brain response. But an, an example of trauma, and, and I was thinking about this as I woke up at 3 a.m. this morning, worried about the presentation. Oh my God, is it going to go well? Uh, am I going to be able to appear educated and, and professional? And, uh, you know, all of these things. And I was thinking about um, you know, where does that come from? Why do I have that? And, and was reflecting back on my trauma egg and, and realized that I have a, this very specific memory of being in seventh grade. And, um, you know, one of, the, uh, one of the ways in which me and my father connected when I was young, uh, there weren't many, uh, but one of the ways we connected was through stamp collecting. Um, he was an avid stamp collector and kind of encouraged and supported me uh, in doing that with him. And it was it was kind of a thing where, um, you know, he he was he was much more involved uh, uh, in this um, than I was. But he kind of brought me along. So it was something I felt special about with stamp collecting. I felt I felt um, selected, seen. Uh, I felt important because it was something important to my dad and he included me in that. So my relationship to stamp collecting was I took a lot of pride in it. I took a lot of happiness in it. And I, I didn't realize it was kind of geeky uh, from the perspective of other seventh graders. Uh, and so what happened was, is in seventh grade, I, I went to a, a, a new high school in which many of the kids who I went to grade school with and were in my neighborhood did not go to. Um, so I was kind of new. Um, I was struggling to make friends. Um, I was dealing at that time with the concept of fitting in. Um, so I was kind of hyper vigilant. I was worried about, is my body giving me away? Um, uh, do people know I'm anxious? Can people see I'm gay? I started to have those thoughts. Um, you know, will people like me? Uh, am I smart enough to be here? I went to a high school that had a lot of gifted students in it. And I was fortunate to get put in those classes, but I never felt like I should be in those classes. So I was kind of in this state of hypervigilance. And so we in seventh grade had to present on a hobby that we had. And so I said, well, I'm going to present on stamp collecting. And I didn't have much experience with doing presentations at that time. I was, um, uh, you know, it, it, first through six, you don't do a lot of presentations. Uh, and my, my peer group in first through six was people I grew up with in my neighborhood. I spent time with them after school and I, I wasn't nervous. So I was very very nervous for this presentation, like horribly nervous. And so I um, kind of collected myself and we'll pretend that, and I apologize, I don't have a fancy background. We just moved and um, I didn't want to cause anyone trauma by showing you the beautiful Hawaii background and all the warm weather we've been having for those of you in Texas who've had endured the past two weeks. So I, I'm using my office, but pretend that this is a chalkboard back here. And so, you know, stamps, they come in really large size uh, sheets. Um, and so I picked, you know, what I thought was the most interesting sheets. Um, and, you know, I was starting to experience a physical reaction as I was sitting in class. Um, I was starting to get sweaty palms. Uh, I could feel a little tightness in my chest. I got that like sick feeling in my gut. And that was my anxiety around presenting, right? And I didn't have a word for it. I started to sweat. I was wearing a wrong shirt. I could see the sweat thing starting in my armpits. And I, I was horrified uh, that I was gonna have to stand up in front of the class. All the cool kids were talking about travel, 
we grew, we grew up very middle class. Our, our travel was to, um, uh, you know, New, New Hampshire to go look at the forest and then drive back home in the same day. Um, and um, we, actually, we did have really good vacations as a kid. But uh, up to that point, my perception was I was missing out on all what these rich kids were getting. Um, and, you know, they talked about travel. They talked about sports. I was as uncoordinated as they come. It was a point of contention for me. They talked about all these really cool hobbies. And I started to feel shame that I liked stamp collecting. So I went up to the board and I had my little sheet and I started talking and my voice sounded like this. And as I put the stamps up, my hand was shaking. I was having a physical anxiety response. And I kept trying to put the stamps onto the board. I got a, I got a good thing. There's a ledge on the chalkboard. And if I can, if I can put it on there, I won't have to hold it. And I can put my hands on the table in front of me. So I put it on the chalkboard and it fell off. So then I had to bend over in front of everyone. I picked it up again, shaking. I could hear some chuckles in the class. I put it up on the chalkboard. It fell over again. So my first experience as a public speaker was awful. It was awful. But it wasn't what most people would consider a big T trauma. But what I realized this morning is that has informed my unconscious response that happens every time I present. I have a trauma response. My palms get sweaty. I get a sick feeling and my crazy brain starts to think you're not good enough. You can't do this. You're going to disappoint. People are not going to think well about you. And the good thing is now I have years of experience seeing the flip side of that. Okay, Eric, I can use my CBT skills. You can, you can, you can see, is this a realistic, uh, is this kind of a real uh, response to be having? No, you've, you've gotten good feedback on doing presentations. You, you, you're, you're, you can put two sentences together. Uh, you can present helpful information. Uh, you're okay. So I have a coping strategy that's much better than the anxiety. But what I'm experiencing is actually a trauma response. The patterns and the 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 storing of that trauma, uh, that fight or flight, that what are we going to do kind of thing pops up every time I have to present. It is like clockwork. It happens all the time. And so. Part of what we want to talk about is being mindful of that, but also uh, kind of noticing what are the patterns that come up as someone is discussing the trauma. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, so a little bit about um, kind of what does happen uh, with trauma. And we're kind of looking at this in a childhood trauma, uh, but trauma is a lifelong experience. Trauma can happen at any point along the developmental process. Um, and if you're not familiar with the ACE study, ACE study, Adver Adverse Childhood Effects, uh, please take a look at that. Um, uh, it can really um, uh, kind of give you insight as to how uh, people's development can be impacted and result in um, all sorts of issues that come up for people. Um, but I really want to kind of po point, point out um, kind of talking about the three centers of the brain, the amygdala, which is kind of the reptilian uh, center, the fear center, the fight or flight, the thing that protects us in our lives, which we don't even have to think about, the things that happen automatically. A lot of trauma response creates an overactive amygdala, which means that your blood, body is flooding with hormones, with stress hormones, um, and your body is in a constant state of hypervigilance. And what happens is that can become the dominating thing that happens anytime we're confronted with a fright, flight or flight. So we may not have access to the underactivated pieces of the brain, which develop with executive functioning and emotions and feeling. Um, so this can be a real challenging thing. And it's a lot of times why people talk about uh, experiential and non-talk therapy as a way to mitigate trauma for people. When we are in our amygdala and in our reptilian brain, it is not, a, there's not a rational kind of thought there. It's not a word-based um, uh, approach. It's not a cognitive functioning. It, it transcends language. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a, it, it transcends the active consciousness that we would expect out of an adult who is functioning and able to process things in a normal way. Um, 
Trauma can uh, impact depression, anxiety. Um, it can be co-occurring when it when there is a pain issue that trauma can can uh, cause some of what Dr. Flowers was talking about um, in terms of kind of almost like intensifying the pain uh, and creating more pain and perception of more pain in people. Um, so, um, you know, it's very, you know, I always take the approach and this is something that I learned from Judy is, is, is uh, we're not looking to, we're not looking to kind of uh, necessarily say um, uh, to, to figure out kind of, uh, you know, what causes the trauma. What we're trying more to do is talk about how do we change the way in which we respond to similar events now than we did when we were traumatized, right? We can understand where the trauma came from. Um, we can tell the story, right? We can look at, uh, you know, I was a young kid. I grew up in a two-parent household. Um, I was provided for. I, I I didn't suffer from feeling neglect. What I would what I would describe as neglect. Um, I had a traumatic experience at thirteen, losing my father. Uh, he died of a heart attack in front of not in front of me, but I witnessed kind of my mother performing CPR on him. Um, and my response was to disassociate. Right. Um, you can have a lot of losses uh, as a result of the trauma. You can have a loss of self worth a loss of sense of self, a loss of physical connectedness to the body, a loss of intimacy, a loss of trust, a loss of danger cues, uh, and a loss of safety. And for me, at that, as that 13 year old, I really developed a disconnect between kind of emotional understanding as well as physical understanding. I kind of locked into that. And there's a great book, um, uh, you know, Crystal, I'll, I'll make sure she has the title, but um, The Body um, Knows the Score um, by uh, Russell, uh, I'm sorry, by Bessel van der Kolk. The Body Keeps the Score, sorry, uh, by Bessel van der Kolk. And what that states is that, that trauma lives on in the body. It lives on in the neural pathways that are developed in the brain. Uh, it lives on in the effect of our stress response and how that impacts our body and functioning. It can create pain. It can create tightness. It can create that that, that feeling in your gut. Um, and there's a lot of studies that show that uh, an approach to treating trauma that allows for the unlocking of that unconscious response and multiple pathways to kind of experience or to ex re-experience or to release that are very powerful. Yoga, massage, um, uh, somatic experience, uh, experiential activities like the trauma egg, those are all really good ways to, to, to deal with trauma. So, um, so onto the trauma egg. So uh, Marilyn and Murray um, had kind of a, a, a kind of an overarching sense of the role of trauma in, in human beings' well-being. And it wasn't a substance abuse approach, uh, but it was an approach that kind of uh, lent itself to um, uh, looking at what has happened in our life? And then what were the ways in which we responded to it? Uh, how did we cope with it? What were the strategies we put in place? Because oftentimes, we, an individual who experiences trauma doesn't have the coping strategies or the ability to process or deal with that in a healthy way. Uh, maybe they have low resilience as a result of a high A score. Uh, maybe their resilience hasn't developed. Uh, maybe their um, protective factors aren't there for them. Um, so there's lots of different ways. I know this is a little blurry on your screen and I'm gonna send this attachment. So for those of you who are requesting the presentations, this attachment will be separate uh, included in that. Um, but this is kind of what we, we give to our clients so that they can begin the process of developing and creating uh, the trauma egg. Um, and, and so, you know, when do we do a trauma egg? Um, obviously, we want our clients to be uh, somewhat stable, um, meaning that we want them to be uh, detoxed. Uh, we want them to be engaging in recovery. We want them to be working with therapists, working with a case manager, working with a family advocate. Um, and what we what we see a lot of is that people who come for mental health and substance abuse issues have a difficult time with emotional regulation. Uh, they're oftentimes dysregulated. They don't have a lot of skills for coping with 
now that drugs and alcohol become their coping skills, right? That's a huge coping skill. And that's why there's such a significant tie to trauma as a contributing factor to substance abuse. You know, we can look and, and try and figure out where did this come from? Why, why is uh, Bobby uh, abusing drugs and alcohol? And, and I think that this is even a fair, fair way to look at you know, those people who, who transition from uh, or who are prescribed medications and are more susceptible. Um, uh, trauma uh, can make us more vulnerable to reaching for things that make us feel better because we're constantly in a state of emotional dysregulation. Um, and, and I think that's a human experience. I don't think that that's necessarily, uh, you have to have trauma to experience that. But when we look at trauma through the lens of Anytime you felt unsafe, anytime um, uh, you felt, um, uh, anytime you felt a, a disconnect or fear, um, that can give us that can that can that can bind us in that kind of experience of what it's like to be human. That's a natural feeling for most people to feel. I, I have a hard. I, I haven't met many people who haven't uh, experienced something that that I think would qualify for um, uh, trauma. So. Um, uh, a couple people asked who's the Judy I'm referencing. Her name is Judy Crane. Uh, she has a facility down in Florida called the Guest House. Uh, she's been a leader in trauma work um, uh, for uh, many years. And I've been very fortunate to do some training with her on becoming a certified trauma therapist. So developing tools to work with people in trauma, understanding trauma and how to do that. Uh, so the, the trauma egg uh, is kind of five different steps or clusters. Um, what you do is you provide a piece of paper, you provide colored markers, uh, colored crayons. Uh, I will say there's no, there's, I want to say there's no wrong way to do a trauma egg, uh, but there are certain things that you want to communicate as being integral to the trauma egg process. So what we look at is, again, going back to our family approach that we use at KSC is we want to understand kind of the family system and family functioning, because that will play an important role into future growth and future development of coping skills and coping strategies. Um, so what are the family roles? Um, what are the unspoken rules or messages? So an unspoken rule or message, and if my mom, my aunt, my sister here, it's great to see you. Um, uh, thanks for being here to support me. Um, if you're not here and watching on the rewind, hello. Um, uh, but they focus primarily on unspoken rules. And one of the unspoken rules in my house was we have to appear good, right? No matter what's going on. We want to we wanna be educated. We want to be financially secure. We want to be respectful. Um, and that was a rule that my family had. Um, as We also want to take a look at family roles. Um, what was your family role? Mine was a little bit the peacekeeper. Um, I wanted to make everybody... Uh, or the mascot is sometimes the term that's used. Uh, I wanted to make everyone happy. I wanted to make, I wanted to smooth things over. I wanted to diffuse any tension. Um, and this particularly became an issue when uh, after my father died, you know, kind of with my mother and my sister, they struggled at times to get along. And that was very distressing to me, right? Um, so my, my goal was, how do I fix this? How do I fix this? How do I fix this? How do I keep everything levity? And kind of how I've developed, you know, kind of a sense of humor as a first line defense to any stressful situation. Uh, my first thing is, how can I make someone laugh? Um, you know, rather than kind of look inward. Um, uh, in the bottom two corners, we want to put in kind of uh, our, what our uh, our paternal uh, role uh, uh, caregiver was, or our, and then in the right-hand corner, um, our, our, what are some characteristics of our maternal caregiver? So for some people, they didn't grow up with a mom or a dad, but they may have had someone who um, functioned in this role. And just kind of words to describe their personality. Um, and it, you want them to include both positive and negative. This is a key piece and insight, again, into the family functioning. What we can see when we talk about trauma, we talk about the transgenerational transmission um, uh, or intergenerational transmission. And, and it's really a big kind of thing when you, you know, for those of you who've ever done a genogram, uh, you know, as an interventionist uh, and as a, as a family therapist and as someone who values the family systems, Genograms can kind of unlock patterns within family systems that are, um, you know, that go beyond kind of the initial or nuclear family system, grandparents, great grandparents, great great grandparents. And, and what we can see when we look at that is we can see the trauma history. 
throughout the family system. So when we look at the roles that mom and dad play, we do that with an eye towards how did they, how, how, um, how suitable, how, how resilient, what perfect, protective factors do they have in place to either prevent trauma, further trauma, to, to um, uh, ignore trauma, or, and I don't mean this, I don't want to take this in a wrong way, or to facilitate even more trauma. Um, and a lot of times uh, trauma can be, again, we talked about how a person receives something. And a lot of times caregivers are, have been traumatized themselves and they don't know how to do something that isn't transmitting that trauma further. So we can gain some really good insight as to the perception of the person doing the trauma egg as to how their uh, primary caregivers were. Um, and then we get to the kind of the meat and the potatoes of the trauma egg. And that's what goes on the inside. So if you remember earlier, I talked a little bit about um, uh, I talked a little bit about what um, what the uh, the kind of unconscious and nonverbal kind of um, uh, piece the uh, amygdala plays uh, that fight or flight that trauma response that many people have. The idea of using pictures is to kind of tap into that kind of nonverbal functioning in the brain and, and to kind of unlock kind of some of the memories that come. You remember I talked about uh, a loss of ability sometimes to be connected. Uh, uh, a loss of memory can be a, a piece. And the drawing is hopefully gives them some tools to be able to unlock that. And you start from the bottom of the egg up. Um, and what you do is you put your earliest memories in which you felt distressed, which you felt unsafe, uh, which you were hurt, uh, which there was physical harm, that maybe there was sexual abuse, uh, maybe there was uh, uh, unwanted, um, unwanted, uh, you were uh, unwant, you, you did not want to participate in something and you were forced to participate in that. Um, you can even include uh, pre-birth events um, kind of at the bottom below the egg. And one kind of the interesting things that, you know, kind of I learned is uh, I went through my trauma egg as well as my uh, genogram as part of my own personal work in recovery um, and things that we do as, uh, you know, kind of interventionists and family therapists is um, I learned that there was a lot of financial stress in my family in particular when I was being born. My mom had a lot of fear about, and I hope mom, you don't mind that I'm sharing all this. So uh, she's a wonderful woman. She was a, an amazing mom. She took really good care of me and my sister. Um, and there was a lot of financial stress uh, leading up to my birth, wondering how am I going to survive? I'm not working. I'm totally reliant on this other person. We have totally different ideas about money and how that should be used and managed. Um, so there was a lot of financial stress and that was kind of a pattern uh, that existed in, in a multi-generational family system of immigrant families um, kind of having no resources, living through the depression. Uh, do you talk about money? Do you not talk about money? Um, and, and those things were repeating themes that repeated in my family system. Um, we struggled a lot after my father died financially. Um, you know, I was horrified to think that my family qualified for food stamps. And thank God we did, um, you know, at that time. You know, my mom made a really great um, decision to go back. She was, my mom is like the smartest person I know. Um, and what she did was she realized, um, I, I've lost my husband. I have two young kids. They're I want them to go to college. Um, I need to support them. She was a nurse at the time. Uh, you know, she worked the overnight. She was a head RN, very successful. And she said to herself, um, you know, I'm going to have to do something different where I can support my family, myself. Um, and at 40, I think 42 or 43 years old, she went back to law school, um, you know, and she graduated to become a lawyer. She worked at some really uh, amazing uh, top-notch law firms doing really uh, uh, amazing work as a lawyer, very successful second career, um, you know, and that resiliency that she had, um, some of that was a result of the trauma she experienced as a kid. And, and, and she helped in me develop many protective factors um, to be able to um, kind of move forward in my own life, um, which has just been amazing. So that fam, again, that intergenerational looking at pre-birth, what was going on uh, kind of as you were born, um, and then you level up, you go from maybe zero to three years, three years to six years, six years to 10 years, and, and you kind of put picture representations of what that trauma was. And again, it's always what that trauma was to you. Um, 
So um, uh, you can see here some more kind of some of those pieces, uh, you know, what is something you heard a lot growing up? Uh, what were family boundaries like, uh, family rules, family roles? Um, uh, and then kind of the details of what happens uh, in the egg. Um, you know, any event that was traumatic, abusive, involved in abandonment, or where you felt uh, or were powerless, that's a really powerful one for people where they felt powerless. And it doesn't mean that they had a terrible outcome. Uh, you know, it doesn't mean that something ended up uh, badly, but that in that moment, feeling powerless, what was that? for. Um, and you want to get a really good context of as much as they can remember. And my own personal experience with the trauma egg is that um, uh, I had um, uh, my first draft or my first run through uh, was significantly lacking in multiple things. Uh, you know, one of the, uh, it, I had finished the trauma egg and, and again, was kind of dialing back to that presentation. And I remembered, um, you know, kind of that uh, concern about when others, um, uh, when others, when I might be judged by others. And I remember, uh, I'll use the term, it flooded back to me almost literally. Uh, in second grade, the teacher had said, um, uh, you know, I'm going to be teaching now. There are going to be no more questions or interruptions from anyone. And my family rule was you are respectful of adults, you excel in school, and you don't cause problems. So as she was lecturing in the second grade, I had to go to the bathroom. And so I sat there and I wrestled with the fact, do I tell her, do I get up and go? Do I raise my hand? And what kept playing for me was that unconscious family message of, we respect our teachers, we don't cause problems, um, we do what we're told. And what she told us was to stay seated. And sure enough, about 20 minutes into that lecture, I wet my pants. Um, I was mortified, horrified. Um, I, I, in fact, to this day, I don't remember exactly what happened. I remember ending up in the nurse's station. I think they called my mom. I think I got a change of clothes or left home early. I can't really remember, uh, you know, what happened after that, but that feeling of horror of, oh my God, I'm disappointing everyone. I'm disappointing the family. And now I'm vulnerable because I've done something that eight year old boys don't do. You don't pee your pants. Uh, so a lot of shame and guilt. And, 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 you know, that's informed that kind of feeling of, I get anxious, I get nervous still today when I don't feel a hundred percent confident in bringing something up or bringing something forward. And it's interesting to see how after doing that trauma egg, that's informing. Crystal, do we have a question? Uh, we've had a few pop up. I've made some notes, but I was just giving you a 10 minute warning. All right, perfect. We're right on time. Awesome. Um, so now what I think, what I feel could be most beneficial is, is what do you do? Uh, oh, here we have some trauma eggs. Uh, these are some clients and you can see across the trauma eggs, the differences in the way people um, uh, present that. Um, you know, a lot of them use the shape. Uh, someone did a more structured uh, analysis um, uh, you know, with their pictures. That middle one is Ken's, um, and, uh, uh, you know, he, uh, is very open about his, his own family history and how those things impacted him. Um, and then, um, but you can see the ones on the right and the left, um, have a different style, um, uh, you know, the use of colors. Um, and there's a lot of, it's really fun to see how people take this on. And some people even go beyond doing an egg. They use different shapes. Um, I've seen people use crosses. I've seen people use coffins, um, all different types of shapes. And we want to encourage uh, creativity. The one thing we, we, we don't allow is for people to use words and write. We would send someone back to the drawing board. We really want them to tap into that visual uh, kind of medium. So these are some sample trauma eggs. Just a brief reminder for those of you who may not have been listening, we will share this presentation. Crystal will send it out and you will have the directions to the trauma um, egg uh, that we can send to you as an attachment. Um, so, you know, uh, how do we use the trauma eggs to help our clients? And I've talked a little bit about unlocking some insight into family functioning. But one thing is we got to remember that this person is sharing with them their experiences. And what what we don't want to do is revel in the actual experience. What we want to hear is how did they respond? 
If someone ends up at our treatment center, it's a good chance that they have a significant drug and alcohol issue or a significant mental health issue. And if they've used drugs and alcohol as a coping strategy for the pain, for the emptiness, for the hurt, for the disappointment that they feel as a result of an underlying trauma, they've been very successful at coping with that pain. Many, many people who experience trauma end up killing themselves because they don't have a way to cope with that pain. And drugs and alcohol are a very accessible, very, um, uh, there's no, you know, when people use that as a solution, I can understand why it becomes difficult to stop using drugs and alcohol. Um, when, when your only relief from what you're feeling and you don't even know what's causing that feeling, imagine blacking out a memory that's stored in your amygdala that doesn't have words, that's flooding your body with stress hormones every time you see something related to that event, but you don't know it's related to that event. Imagine how distressing that would feel. And then you take a sip of beer or you smoke some a joint or you are given a pain pill. Imagine the relief that comes from feeling that. Um, and so what happens is people develop a hustle or a response um, to deal with that underlying emotional issue. And that's really what we're looking for. What are the coping strategies? What are the skills? What are the things that they've put in place? Um, and this is really, when I talked about learning from Judy, this is where I really learned from Ken is he's super, super perceptive at this. Um, and he's learned to be able to listen to the story and identify the underlying themes that are popping up. Where are the themes? Where are the coping strategies? Where are the behaviors coming into place? And then how can we develop an awareness of our own emotional state when we're dysregulated and then use those coping strategies, but in a healthier manner that's more recovery oriented, right? And Dr. Flowers talked about all those really great interventions from mindfulness um, to CBT skill development to DBT skills to emotional regulation. Um, all of those things are things that we would want to provide our clients in an effort to kind of come up with new coping strategies. But what I find is that people who are who make it through to the doorway to recovery are already, already imbued with resilience. They found a way to survive. And it may not have always been the best way to survive now that they have uh, an awareness of, of what they did and, and, and maybe how that hasn't been as healthy as possible. But the fact that they survived is a testament. Um, I, I watch these trauma eggs and I get so, so overwhelmed when I look at what people have endured and the fact that they're here today means that they have all the tools already. And what I'm giving them is just additional tools. What I'm giving them is, uh, you know, um, uh, additional ways to, to be able to um, kind of uh, continue to work, but they've already got it. And that's that hustle. And, you know, sometimes people say, how can you use your powers for good? And, and I, don't, well, I don't, I don't want to create more trauma. For you. Uh, you know, I, I often worry when, when I mention Ken that, that he likes me to say things a certain way. So this could be traumatic for me and coming in in the middle of my presentation. Um, but no, I mean, what did you want to say? Yeah, no, I, I, I love it what you're talking about because the trauma that people go through is, you know, when you lose the genogram and you do the trauma egg, you're able to see, you know, we just did a training this past weekend and Caroline Smith, that's part of our trainings. She had a, a picture of a tree with a beautiful house on top of, you know, it, on this property and underneath it was all the roots. And so that was all the family's hustle. Their, their traumatic experiences that are brought up to the, their, their offsprings and so when you do a trauma egg, you're able to see that hustle, mm -hmm. like mine, oh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that hustle. And that hustle has been rooted in their family tree for so many generations that that's the problem. And everybody, when they go to treatment, it's the identified person's problem. It's the identified person's problem. But in all reality, it's a family system problem. 100%. And that's what I love about what Eric's been doing in our treatment center. Every Tuesday, he does a family group therapy session 
where the family gets into treatment because the trauma is so intense with the identified person, but the family members had their trauma. And if we could treat the whole family, then we're, we're making headway in creating a safer and a healthier environment for the system instead of just the individual. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's point on and you kind of already uh, uh, did the last slide, which is, um, you know, gaining clinician takeaway is, you know, we have the case manager, we have the therapist, we have Ken, uh, we'll have the family advocate all sit in on the trauma egg, and even we'll invite the family to participate if, if that's appropriate. And it, it is such a gift to that system and to be able to kind of take a multidisciplinary approach across different uh, ways to ensure that uh, we're being trauma informed, we're treating them with care and respect, but we're also challenging them to find new ways of functioning is, is really important. And my family session on Tuesdays at 5 p.m. Pacific is open to everybody. You do not have to be a family at KSC to participate. Um, but um, we, so we'd love to see you there. I'll get Crystal the information on that. Um, and I'd love to, um, I just have a little bit, one more slide for some, um, oh, just talking about the family approach. Uh, from intervention to treatment to aftercare, the trauma-informed piece in that. Um, uh, please, you know, kind of keep that in mind. Uh, you know, our, our motto is, you know, uh, be clear it's a year and we involve the family system from the start. Um, so anytime we get to partner with other individuals who are providing great care, we love to do that. And here's some contact information for me and I'm sure Crystal will share that. Um, and would love to leave a little bit of time for some questions. Yeah, thank you. I haven't got to, I know that um, Atonda is more familiar with your trauma egg stuff and has told me how amazing it is, but I haven't personally got to see it. So I, it was very interesting. Um, I did write down a couple of questions. There were several different ones that popped up, but I wrote down a couple that I thought were um, maybe important. So someone said, can you clarify something? Is suggesting that a miscarriage, that miscarriages are consequences and results of trauma? Like, is it, is that okay? I guess they're saying, is that okay? Yeah, I, I don't know that I would say that a miscarriage is a result or cause of trauma, although significant trauma can lead to health issues. Mm -hmm. uh, but for sure, having a miscarriage could be perceived by the person as a traumatic experience Absolutely. that impacts them. So for sure. Um, someone also asked how to get more, and I thought this was really important because I think a lot of people want to know this, if they, how they could get more information on the trauma egg. Yeah, so there's a lot of good resources online. Um, you can also call me. Um, we're trying, we've been, we've been thinking, you know, for professionals who work in the field, uh, oftentimes we become the helper um, and we can still benefit from the help. So we're coordinating with Lauren and Caroline about how we might be able to offer this to professionals kind of in a six week rolling course. Um, but certainly, you know, uh, you can reach out and find a certified trauma therapist or certified trauma professional uh, who may be able to help you uh, kind of experience that. Um, you know, it's by no means a be all and end all to resolving trauma, but the windows that it opens uh, mm -hmm. and insight that you gain is, can be unbelievable. Even just watching one, um, not even doing it yourself. Yeah. And then we'll do this one more that I think is super important. They, they asked, um, is the trauma egg done individually? Can it be done in a group? And then about how long does it take to complete? Yeah, that's a great question. And Rasa, who just put a something in the chat, we see you. Uh, don't worry, everyone will get a copy of this presentation, Dr. Flowers' presentation, our contact information. Uh, you don't have you, to request you, it. I'm going to send it to everybody. Yeah, <laughs> if you re if you signed up, you're going to get the CEs too. It's just a wonderful thing. So they, they take care of everything. So thank you, Crystal. Um, yeah, we, I believe, um, I'm a big fan of group therapy. Um, and this was, uh, thank you for asking that because it is one thing I left out. We always do them in a group setting. Um, and the reason for that is because what that offers an opportunity is, is it's kind of like a, that two-way dynamic that happens in group therapy. One, the, the participant or witness to the trauma egg can give you some feed, can give the person who's doing the, the, the trauma egg some feedback. Wow, I really identified with how you dealt with when you were sexually abused because I was sexually abused too. So there can be some connection, there could be some shame reduction. Um, all of those things can, can be a benefit. Um, the other thing is, is that um, 
it can, it can really kind of open up a discussion about some really difficult or painful things that people often are shy about talking about. Um, and whether that's because they feel that they're the only one or they feel that it's not appropriate, it gives permission uh, for some really to dig deep and allow people to feel confident in bringing that stuff up. Um, we always do them in a group setting. Um, anything else to add on the group yeah. dynamic? And the feedback, the feedback that the individual gets from their peers is so powerful. So yeah, that's a really good question. I, I, don't, I don't really agree in doing them alone with one-on-one -on -one with someone. I think the, the group is really the only way to get the fullest out of what the experience could be for the individual. Thank you. Great job. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you again to Dr. James Flowers and Eric McLaughlin for this amazing continuing education presentation. If you would like to be added to our CEU emailing list, please email ceu at chemopalms.com. Thank you for tuning in and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. See you again soon.